Hi everyone and welcome to lesson 6. Today we'll be reflecting on what a theory is at a very abstract level. What really characterizes today's lesson is that it's not just sort of difficult to understand what the answer is, but even understanding the question and the issue at hand can be can be tricky. So just so you know already in advance, you might not exactly know and figure out what these questions even mean from the beginning, but during the lecture and, and, and hopefully at the end of, of this and the next lecture, it should become more clear what's going on. So we'll be trying to answer these questions here. How do we know something about the world? How certain can we be about the social science world that we make theories about? And what is this social science world after all? We call these issues epistemology and ontology, and we'll get more back to, to those terms later on. But here initially, I want to use Nelson to make a contrast to physics and some natural sciences in order to make sense of what's the deal in social science, what situation are we in. So we will be, be making that comparison and contrast to physics because it will tell us a lot about what situation that we are in here in the social science. And sort of very briefly and crudely put on an overall level, it can be illustrated and highlighted via this example that I already showed in, in, in lesson one. We have a very good idea of what an atom looks like, this simple version of an atom. And, and we have that theoretically, but we also have that because we can, we can empirically really measure what one atom looks like. We can sort of take a picture. We'll get a little bit more back to that in the Kuhn lesson, in lesson nine. But um, we have a very good idea of what an atom looks like and whether we'll check this atom or that atom or another atom in in, uh, in another part of the globe or another part of the galaxy or universe, they will basically be identical and we will have a very good idea of it and we can point to it. We can say, look, here it is. Well, let's consider the efficient market hypothesis or any theory on motivation. We can't to the same clear degree say, look, this is where the essence of a motivation is. We can't point to any place in the human body whether in consciousness or physically, and say, this is what motivation is. It's just a different kind of construct. It's a different thing. Um, and this is what we then will want to address. And it's the same with the efficient market hypothesis. We might have a good theoretical understanding, sort of roughly what it is, and we can use it to explain today's capitalistic uh, society and how um, values uh, sort of emerge and unfold. But we can't sort of point to somewhere in a stock market and say, look, here it is. And sometimes the market appear to be less efficient than they should be. So what's the deal with that? Um, atoms, they, they behave always the way that we expect them to do. There is something particular about the social sciences that makes it different to sort of this atom comparison. And this is what the Nelson text is about. He's trying to make us reflect on what kind of science is economics or business administration. And, and one of the key things he wants to say is that we sometimes hear, whether it's politicians or scientists, or just a lay understanding, saying, well, physics, that's the proper science, and, and if something can't be sort of as robust and clear as what we find out in physics, well, then it's not really a proper science. In contrast, Nelson is saying we should not model social science and physics. We, we, and he's explaining why the social sciences are different and why these things are important. And he's also pointing out there are actually a range of natural sciences that aren't like physics. So if we sort of have the classical physics expectations of being able to predict as we can in classical physics, well, then biology and meteorology, et cetera, are not, sort of, are not cutting it as well. They're not um, as clear as, as, as the physics sciences. So, so this is what he's aiming for. He wants us to think about how certain can we be about the conclusions we draw in business administration why is there sometimes uncertainty and why is that okay? So how can we talk about business administration as a science? And again, the contrast we're making is, and the question we could ask ourselves is, why can't social science lead us to Newtonian law like in physics? It used the theory of gravity to, in this equation to very, very clearly and accurately predict movement of any kind of, of a movement of objects or, for instance, the locations of planets. Um, and the thing here with planets or atoms, I mean, we can describe them sort of completely in numbers. As long as we know the weight and the 
um, and the density and, the, and the, for instance the speed of a planet and, and and we measure the speed of all the other planets in a given solar system then we can exactly and precisely predict where Jupiter is going to be 230,000 years and four months and seven days and three hours and five seconds from now we, we can do that to that extreme degree of precision um, and, and we can do that because we can as mentioned exactly measure what a planet is we can sort of define the essence of a planet while we can also ignore all the other stuff that is out there in the solar system. There is galactic dust and there are comets and in principle we could send out spaceships to try to interfere with these planetary movements. But it's just, I mean, they're just too small and insignificant and, and we can just ignore them. Um, we can still make these very good predictions even though we ignore all these factors. So this is just to say, this is the comparison we in principle could make. This is the state of the art in physics. We have these homogeneous phenomena. We explained and, and measured one atom hydrogen atom, we measured them all, and we can ignore a bunch of factors. And let's keep that in mind when we try to understand when we try to understand the social sciences. But before that, I also just sort of want to highlight the point that Nelson is also making. There are a bunch of natural sciences that aren't like physics. Any storm is not like any other storm. I mean, they're all different in some significant way. It's not that we can't sort of try to say this the storm is here and we can make reasonable good predictions of where it's heading. As, as, as this link is talking about, but it's not like one hydrogen atom is identical to another one. It's not like one storm is identical to the other one. Um, and there are also a bunch of different things that could potentially influence where a storm is moving. I mean, meteorology is still a pretty precise science. It, it, it still does rather well. Um, and it's no surprise that it, it's snowing today when, I, when I'm making this video because meteorologists had predicted that. So just to say, Physics shouldn't be used as a prototype for all kinds of sciences because, I mean, even other natural sciences aren't as precise and and, um, and we can't sort of make the clear causal predictions as, 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 as we can in physics and many other natural sciences. So and this is then getting to a key uh, a key slide and a key three key elements of, of the Nelson paper. First of all, what he's trying to say is that the subject matter that we study in social sciences they sort of fall into different classes and there's heterogeneity in each class. If we want to study human beings, they are not all just completely identical. They're going to be very different. If we study companies, they're different. If we study entrepreneurs, they're different. If we, 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 we can't sort of reduce them to a very small number of well-defined variables as we can in a planet and just say, give me these two, three pieces of information about a planet and I can make all the predictions that you want. It's simply impossible when we talk about firms and people and, and countries and stock markets, etc. Um, so we can't as easily define the concept that we're dealing with. What is um, an innovative company or what is a motivated human being? Or it, it, it's just, it's not that we can't say anything about it, but it's not like with a hydrogen atom where we could just completely draw it and have a perfect understanding of it. So that's the, the units that we're interested in, but also the things that then sort of influence and we, we can then talk about well what influences motivation or a company's performance and then Nelson is making the point there's a bunch of different things that influence stuff in the social sciences there are numerous highly variable and often can't be separated sharply from one another um, if we're interested in firm performance we can't just sort of say okay let's look at competitors and what they're doing we have to for instance look at the competitors. We have to look at the individuals in the company. We have to look at technological developments. We have to look at the global sort of uh, economy. We have to consider whether COVID-19 crisis is just going to influence and, and sort of disrupt everything. I'll give a few more examples of this in, in, in just a bit, but this is just sort of the second overall point that Nelson is making. For one, the things we're interested in are uh, heterogeneous um, if we are comparing a bunch of people and, and, and how well they're doing, for instance, in the O'Reilly experiment, they are not going to be completely identical. And the second point is, in addition, it's not as easy as with planetary movements just to say, well, there are only eight other planets and, and the sun that really influencing the way that the world uh, revolves around the sun. There is going to be a ton of things that we have to be interested in if we are thinking about firm performance. And as this quote by a famous phys physicist Richard Feynman says, imagine how much harder physics would be if electrons had emotions. I mean, there's just a ton of different things that can influence human behavior. 
and to make it even more complicated, the stuff we study can even change over time. We'll get back to that in a later lesson. Um, but that, of course, doesn't make it easier that an atom is an atom and it was the same thing four billion years ago and will probably be the same thing two billion years from now. Human beings, companies, um, concepts, etc., they can change all the time. So there is something about the social science world that we're studying that limits what we can do. Um, and it's fundamentally different from, for instance, the classical physics. Let me give you a few more examples of this. So if we look at biology, and, and here there is someone who really took a bunch of E. coli cells, and what is it, 30, 40 years ago, it's described in this wiki page, he uh, took these 12 populations of, of these E. coli and then sort of had them in these sort of different kinds of vials or glasses, and then he made them sort of evolve as they do. They replicate themselves and and, and, um, and as we can see over time, this is what we have on the x-axis, we have the number of generations of E. coli cells that have sort of been reproducing over time. And on the y-axis we have the cell volume, so how many E. coli cells were there in each vial of glass. And of course, I mean, it's not that they were identical, but it was pretty close, the number of the cell volume. Over 10,000 generations, it's actually continued to do We've been doing this over 50,000 generations. Um, imagine that we let 12 populations of human beings develop separately for 10 or 15,000 generations. I mean, the variety would just be absolutely enormous. First of all, many of them might have died out. Others will be extremely big. Some will just barely have survived. This is just not the reality we see in biology. And, and it's not just something we can speculate on. Someone has run the exact experiment with the same and the same 12 original populations of E. coli cells are still evolving in, in his research lab. And here is just a quote that, that again makes the same point. Heterogeneity of entrepreneurial phenomena. We have different kinds of people starting economic activities for different reasons, different processes at different paces, different resources, different industries, cultures, economic environments. This is just the heterogeneity of human, in this case, entrepreneurial behavior we're looking at. And this is a, a basic condition of of social science in general and business administration in particular. And, and if, if, if physicists had to deal with that, they could not come up with this easy, not easy, but at least relatively short and simple theory of gravity. So there's something about the construct that we're interested in. What does it mean to be unemployed? An example that Nelson also uses. I mean, that can mean you don't want a job. That can mean you have enough money that you just focus on your hobby. It could mean that you're very, very actively searching for a job. It could mean that you'll take a job if you can find it. It can mean that you're working, uh, sorry, not working, but you're at home taking care of your newborn kids. I mean, being unemployed or seeking a job can mean many, many different things. And we might put a bunch of people into that same category but they will consist of different motivations, resources, interests, and, and different willingness to actually get a job. It's so also using the innovation example. What does it mean for a company to be innovative? Have they sort of developed something completely brand new to the world, or is it just a small new addition? And how do we even measure whether something is innovative? Um, is it just based on how much, many products they can sell, or is it experts that have to assess how innovative something is? It's just not clear that we can sort of talk about the constructs as precisely as we can in, in other fields. Um, so this is also what he's saying in the quote here, that the underlying conception of the phenomena that we study, they are blurry edges, they are constructed numbers. There isn't anything like in, 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 in physics. We might have struggled with understanding physics in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, but there was something that we could get to. With unemployment or innovation or, or all the other concepts we have in business administration, it doesn't seem to be the case that there's sort of one underlying fundamental thing that being unemployed is. Um, so it's a constructed number. Um, we make assumptions when we make our measurements. And we can sort of try to measure these phenomena, but it's a limited measure. It might be useful, but limited. So we can make a definition of what it means to be unemployed. And we can make a definition of innovation. And we can work with that, but it's useful, but limited. And as he says, this is something we need to be aware of in terms of how certain conclusions we think we can come up with and what kind of science we, we, we can we can make. Just to just to give you sort of a simple example of this, in this is just 
the essence of what this is doesn't really matter, but this is a typical statistical analysis. We have some independent variable and we want to predict um, some kind of dependent variable. And then we might say, well, whether people have a university degree or not is and might, might have been an important factor. It doesn't seem to be the case in this study. But it's not like sort of putting an atom in as an independent variable and then knowing that everyone in this category are exactly the same. Well, having a university degree could be from Howard, it could be from Aarhus, it could be from anywhere else in the world, potentially. It, it, I mean, this would be a very heterogeneous group that's been sort of lumped into one overall variable. And it's not clear, as Nelson is saying, that there's sort of one underlying clear conception of, of something there that we're trying to get to. We're, we're constructing um, our variable to some degree. We're deciding, is a bachelor degree university degree, or does it have to be a master's degree? Do we include online universities? We're making assumptions, we're making decisions as, as we go along. And that is the essence of the kind of social science that we have to do. We have to make that kind of um, decisions. And on top of that, I talked about how the, 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 the entities that we study in social science, they can change over time. Kieran Healy makes a very succinct point that we should think of social science as a small bit like hurricane forecasting, except the hurricane is able to watch the news and change its behavior accordingly. This is what we are facing in the social science. We can have someone read theories and then realize that, that maybe I should change behavior. That's going to be more efficient. And, and, and we can sort of respond to whatever we are told and to the theories that we have. And we'll get back to that in lesson 13. But um, this is just already now to indicate, again, another sort of particular nature of social sciences. That's different from meteorology, for instance. We're dealing with self-reflecting human beings that can decide to change behavior over time. And that just clearly doesn't make our job any easier. Sort of the original economist take on all this, and you might have heard this concept of homo economicus, was actually quite literally to base economics on physics as an idea. If you read some of the earliest economics textbooks from the early 20th century or late um, or late 19th century, this is quite literally what they did. They were trying to copy and imitate physics. And, and so there is this idea that we are dealing with homo economicus and they are rational and they only focus on money as an incentive. And we're all basically like that. Maybe emotions sort of come in the way, but, but that's just because we're weak human beings. In the end, we are these rational human beings and we can predict how we are going to be influenced. And that's the dream that economics has had. And this was necessary to have that. That's an also the point. That if we want to come up with clear sort of mathematical, uh, clear predictions of human behavior, then we need these homogeneous beings. We need to make these assumptions um, just as they've been able to do in, in physics. And we see here an example of it here in this paper that I'm referring to here. So there is a paper, <clears throat> the exact details are not 100% important, but there is this paper here that's trying to find out if high leverage is optimal for banks. So should they sort of spend the, the, the um, the, the money they have, the, the corona they have in, in, in many different times. Um, and, 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 and what they're then trying to do in their model, as you can see down here, is that the model they're trying to create, the explanation they're trying to create for establishing that high bank leverage is good, they are ruling out deposit insurance, taxes, and all other distortionary factors. They are then posing these idealized conditions. I mean, they're doing the exact same thing that, 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 that uh, sort of the whole comparison that physics is also illustrating that, that physics can do. When we try to predict planet, planetary motion, we can rule out all sorts of stuff, galactic dust and comets, etc., because they're not important. The question then is, can we really rule out taxes, agency, deposit insurance, etc., when we try to explain whether banks should behave in this or that way? That is not as obvious that it's actually possible to make these simplified assumptions. Um, and, and, and this is, an, again, referring back to Nelson's three points. This is what he's trying to say, that there's a bunch of different things that, that, that influence whatever we're interested in. And it's just not easy to isolate them and assume them away, as this paper has been trying to do, um, because the forces and conditions that influence the subjects that we study 
uh, numerous, highly variable, and often cannot be separated sharply from one another. This is what they've been trying to do here. But Nelson's point is we can't easily do that. We can't know whether removing taxes from the equation doesn't sort of disturb the whole picture because they do influence. Another way of making this point is to, to reflect on what Nelson has said about experiments and the limits of experiments. And then and, and we've talked about that <clears throat> the, the essence of the value of an experiment is that, that the different classrooms were probably as good as identical. Um, but Nelson is here explicitly saying that if we're sort of doing experiments in an educational setting, there are differences between schools and there are even differences within a school between classrooms. We can't be certain that the entities we've been studying, if we, for instance, decide to do a randomized controlled trial across uh, a bunch of schools and a bunch of classrooms, we are assuming that all these different classrooms function in the same way, but in practice they might not. <clears throat> in the elementary school example, maybe some classes opened the windows at 11 o'clock and maybe some classes didn't open it at 11, some classes maybe opened it at 12, and maybe somewhere they ate lunch in a different way than they did the other place. We, 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 we have to assume that they're identical when we run our analysis of the randomized control trial, but in practice there aren't really. And Nelson is again just saying there's a bunch of things that influence um, what we're interested in in business administration in a different way than if we are studying planets or atoms where we can make all these simplifying assumptions. So just to get back to this slide that I've shown before, this overview, really keep this in mind and keep these three different elements in mind that this is what Nelson is saying, the subject matter that we study, it's heterogeneous. We can't just say this is a good company performance or this is what a highly motivated person looks like or this is what an entrepreneur is. They are going to be different. And there is a lot of heterogeneity and that does create a challenge. Furthermore, not only are the concepts that we're interested in heterogeneous, they are also being influenced by a ton of different things. Um, it's not like an atom that can only be influenced by very few forces in the world. Human beings and companies um, can be influenced by, by competitors and global market situations and the health of the CEO or the weather or whatever sort of we could imagine. There is just a ton of different things that in the end could influence um, what is going on. It's not easy to separate them sharply from one another. Um, and again, as mentioned, the subject matter changes over time. So there is a limit to what we can do in social science and it's simply because of the nature of the world that we're interested in. And we need to sort of acknowledge that and take that into account when we try to figure out, well, what kind of conclusions can we draw and get to in the social sciences? Um, here I've just added a bunch of quotes that are relevant to sort of make sense of what Nelson is saying. I won't go through them in detail here. Um, but, but, but as he's in, maybe just make this one point that we're trying to measure motivation and leadership and organizational culture and, and strategies and supply and demand. And sometimes we can make fairly direct measurements and sometimes we can't. Um, it sort of depends on the situation we're in, how easy it is to, to measure what we're interested in. But we can never get to the precise measurement as what an atom is or what a plant is. This is just for you to reflect. Um, how easy is it to measure whatever you're interested in in your bachelor project? It's certainly not going to be as easy as planets and it's not going to be as easy to see what influences whatever you're interested in. But So it's worth thinking about what is it that I'm actually interested in? How heterogeneous are whatever variables I'm looking at and how many different things can in principle influence it? And does this thing, does the stuff that I'm interested in actually change over time? That's the point that Nelson is making that we should reflect on and be aware of when we think about a given research project. So this is sort of Nelson's message here. We should not treat physics sort of the ability to come up with natural laws and perfect predictions as an idea, ideal because we are in a completely different situation. We have very heterogeneous phenomena we're interested in and, and relations that we are trying to uncover. We just have to be very transparent and, and, and honest about that. We shouldn't just say, I measured employment or unemployment. We should acknowledge, well, I measured unemployment in this way and I realized that this might be problematic because these kinds of unemployed people are not included or, or I'm actually including unemployed people that don't really want a job and does that really count? So being, that's his point then also, one should be very transparent about the 
way that you're measuring whatever you're interested in and acknowledge whether it could have been measured in a different ways and then make provide an argument for why you did what you did. Um, and, and then also saying that, that, that both quantitative and qualitative work can be important. It depends on what you're going for, depends on the field that you're looking at. Um, and, and, and there is a point that the more homogeneous a field is, that there sometimes it is possible to say, well, we are only interested in, in money in this context, anything else is sort of irrelevant. Um, maybe that is sometimes almost possible, but it's, it's just not going to be as obviously possible as in, in, in some natural sciences. And as this old quote from Aristotle, from well, published in 76, but of course written thousands of years ago, you should not expect more precision in the treatment of any subject than the nature of the subject permits. Demanding logical demonstration from a teacher of rhetoric is clearly about as reasonable as accepting mere plausibility from a mathematician. So just sort of the point is that we should acknowledge what field social science and business administration is, and then accept that we will have reduced uncertainty because of heterogeneity, because of lots of different things influencing, because stuff changes over time. And that is just the situation that we, we have to accept. <laughs>